In part one of lecture one, we will introduce translators and compilers. Before we start looking at the various parts of a compiler, let's take a look at a few basic definitions that we will need. The word translate is a verb, meaning to turn into one's own language or another. Alternatively, it means to transform or turn from one set of symbols into another. Translator is a noun, someone or something that translates. And in what we're going to be doing, the second definition is more helpful. Compilers are translators that produce object code, a machine runnable version of the program based on source code, the human readable version from which it der is derived. Interpreters are translators that translate only as much as is necessary to run the next statement of the program. When we think about writing a compiler, there are actually three separate languages we think in terms of. The source language is the first one, the language in which the source code, the version of the program the programmer wrote, appears in. Then there is the target language, the language into which the object code is written. Usually it will be in the low level machine language code for a given computer, but it could be something else. It could be an, into assembly language. It could be into some sort of something like bytecode. And there's also the implementation language, the language in which we actually will write the compiler. So in a case like this, the source language might be C++. The target language might be the machine language for Pentium level processors. The implementation language might be, for example, Java, if that's what we are writing the compiler in. Originally, it was common for the implementation language for a compiler to be an assembly language. This could be translated very easily into the machine language of the computer. It's become customary in many instances to write a compiler in the source language uh, that you are translating. And you have to ask, why would you look to do that? Well, the compiler then can be used as sample program to test the ability of the compiler to translate complex programs that utilize the various features of the source language. In effect, the test data for the, pro for the compiler is the compiler itself. Now, what we will end up doing when we do this is that we will end up getting a version of the compiler that was translated uh, by itself. And this is known as bootstrapping the compiler. Another thing that we can also do, and we'll do in many cases, is to write the compiler in a different language. Many times we'll do this because the other language may give us uh, access to certain programming features that we need that might not necessarily appear in the language itself. This would probably be fairly commonplace if you were talking about a small language, such as a typical scripting language. The slide shows in diagram form the process of compiling a program. We start off with the object code, the version of the program written in the higher level language. And we will now run it through the compiler and we will get a translation of the code that we included. You'll see a little side arrow that goes down to a box marked assembler version. This is an option that we may have in many instances, and we can see what the program looks like in assembly language, which is far easier to read than in machine language. The problem is that there are many things missing from this. One illustration I'll frequently give is how the front page of the New York Times is assembled, where what you'll find on the front page are the beginning of a variety of different news articles, all of which are continued inside. When they first compose the front page, they can't include the page number onto which it's continued, at least not until they compose the inner pages. So that'd be something that at the bottom that may read continued on page and the page number will be left blank to be filled in later when they have composed the pages where the articles will continue. 
We have something similar here where we will be making reference to variables at locations in memory that we have not allocated storage for yet. Or we may be looking at methods or even entire code modules that have not yet been included in this, although they may be referenced. These are all put together into one file by the linker, which will resolve all the references so we have all the code in there that we need. And at the same time, it will include any other formatting that may be necessary to have a fully functional executable version to run on whatever computer and whatever operating system you're running this on. This slide shows the process that a program being interpreted goes through. In this case, our source code is actually the data for a program, namely the interpreter. And the interpreter will first take the program as we have it and create an intermediate representation that it can work through far more quickly than it can through the text file. From there, it will go through it statement by statement, executing what the statement requires of it without saving any translation of it. it will, the, the interpreter will also take in input as it is necessary and as it is available, and from all of this it will produce output. It's important to note that there is no low-level version of the program that is saved, and the translation is done bit by bit as it is necessary. The language that human beings want to work in is the one that is closest to human languages. The problem is they're not always so easy to translate. What the computer ideally would like is something that is fairly low level. The idea of source languages is that they try to reach the best compromise between human readability and human ability to understand it versus the computer's ability to take it and execute it as it's written. This leads us to languages that we usually refer to as context-free grammars. In other words, that certain grammatical features will show up and will always have the same form regardless of the context in which we find them. And there are many examples of these. Earlier languages include Fortran, COBOL, BASIC, Pascal, C, Lisp. And there are languages that are newer that come from these also. C++, uh, Scheme, Java, JavaScript, Ruby, and other examples along the way. The advantage of source languages is that they should be portable, something that we can move from one computer to another with minimal or no rewriting at all, where the only thing that we need is a translator, be it a compiler or an interpreter, that can allow us to run it on that other machine. The level of abstraction of, should match that of the problem and not that of the hardware, nor should we require an intimate knowledge of the computer's hardware for this to work. Now, we also have assembly language along the way. Here, what we're using are acronyms or abbreviations for the machine language commands that we're using. So for example, in the example you see here, move AX comma three, what we're doing is we're taking the value three and moving it or copying it into the AX register. This eliminates the worst of the details, but still leaves many to be dealt with. As we said before, the object module holds a machine language version of the program that will lack some of the necessary references. What you see below is what the layout of the instruction is in real mode for an Intel 8x86 processor. 1011, which is 11, is the move instruction for an immediate value being moved into a register. The first byte after that tells the computer that this is a 16-bit value that we're working with. We then have three bits to specify which register it is. 000, zero, zero means the AX register. The remaining 16 bits are used to hold the immediate value that is going to be moved into the register. The load module is a bit of a different story. 
This is a machine language of the version that is complete with all the references resolved, with all the necessary methods and files copied into one file to, in a format that is acceptable for an executable program on this particular computer. There are compilers that don't necessarily follow the model we saw before, where we translate the program and then use a linker to get everything necessary for the executable file. Load and Go compilers are one example of this, where they directly generate the executable code without the use of a linker. The biggest disadvantage of this is that you cannot have a program spread across different files. Cross compilers will run on one type of computer, but generate translations for use on other types of computers. Realia does a good job of this with COBOL, where you can develop your code on a PC and then have it cross compiled so it can run on, for example, a mainframe computer. Cross language compilers will translate from one high level language to another, for example, from C++ to C. When Johnny Strustrup first created the C++ language, C++ programs had to be pre-processed and translated into standard C. And from there, it could be translated to something that would run on the computer.